Greetings and shalom. This is Reverend John Ferret, and welcome to session four of the podcast series called The Archaeology of Passover. And this is the final session in this series. Now, you'll remember in session three that there is a very fascinating connection between the resurrection of Jesus on the first day of the week and the feast of of Bikarim, the Feast of First Fruits, especially if it's 30 AD. And in session three, we realize that on that day, it's the beginning of the barley harvest, the beginning of the first harvest, the high priest actually made loaves of bread, two loaves of unleavened bread, thanking God for the harvest, giving praise and glory and honor to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob for taking care of his people. Bread was the staple of their diet. It's the bread of life. And here is Jesus. He says in John 6, 35, that he is the bread of life. And the resurrection happens on the Feast of Bikarim. As the high priest lifted up those two loaves of unleavened bread before the Father, thanking him, thanking God for the bread of life, so too Jesus rises from the dead. He's lifted up before his Father. He's lifted up before all the world. And he is the bread of life, as he said in John 6, 35. Why unleavened bread? Well, it's related to the Feast of Unleavened Bread because this Feast of Bikarim happens in between the first day of the, uh, of the feast and the seventh day. It happens normally right in between. So the Torah said no leaven is to be found during that week. So obviously they're going to make, or the high priest would make, or the priest would make, loaves that they would lift up before God that would be unleavened. Now this is interesting to me. I kind of look at those two loaves lifted up. It's almost a, a picture for me. I'm, and I'm not trying to say this is what it means, but to me it's a picture. It's a picture for me of his first coming, Jesus' first coming is the bread of life and his second coming. Unleavened loaves. We talked about leaven, or we talk about leaven as Christians to talk about that leaven is like a, a representative of sin in our lives, but Jesus has no sin. He's unleavened. In Hebrews 4, verses 14 through 15, the writer of Hebrew talks about the fact that Jesus is without sin. He is unleavened. A picture of our Messiah, our Lord. It's also a picture, to me, a message, if you would, that this story is not over because this is the first harvest. The bread of life and again, the bread of life as we picture Jesus who rises from the dead. This is just the beginning. This is the beginning of a new life for Jew and Gentile alike. And it's the first harvest. He is the first fruits, which means there's a second harvest. And with that second harvest, that second harvest, in terms of bringing people into the church, is going to last until he comes again. Session three, we also talked about the fact that there's a, the count began on that day. It was called the Omer count or the count of the Omer. An Omer is the Hebrew word for a sheaf of barley. Uh, a sheaf is just a big collection pile of barley. You, you would see these things in farmer's fields, a sheaf. And so you might say it's counting the sheaf or counting the Omer, obviously in Hebrew. And they're counting down seven full Sabbaths, which is 49 days. And on the 50th day, the day after that last Sabbath week, is the Feast of Pentecost or the Feast of Shavuot. It's the beginning of the wheat harvest. Passover is the beginning of the barley harvest in Jesus' day. Shavuot or Pentecost is the beginning of the wheat harvest. And remember, Pentecost is, means 50 in Greek. Shavuot means weeks in Hebrew. And those are the two names, whether in Greek or Hebrew, for that feast. And again, it's like for Jesus, he, he's the bread of life. He's the first harvest. 
And the second harvest, the wheat harvest, begins that Pentecost, begins on that Feast of Shavuot. Because we remember on that feast, and we'll be talking about that in another series coming up, 3,000 were added to the church on that day. On the Feast of Shavuot, the wheat harvest had begun. It was the ingathering of the people into the church. The Pharisees, they said, you know, we're going to do the count. We're going to start it the day after the first day of unleavened bread. So they would have their Passover meal on the 15th of Nisan in the evening, and then the day would pass, and after the 15th of Nisan on the 16th of Nisan, they would start the count. That would be their feast of Bikarim. Now, it's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that the day after the Sabbath, you will begin the count. The Bible also shows us that these feast days, the first day of unleavened bread, the seventh day of unleavened bread, the feast of Shavuot, Pentecost, all of these, they are not Sabbaths. God never said they were. The Pharisees did. Now, it's possible that the Pharisees are building a fence around the Torah law. I'll give you an example. In Jesus' day, and even today, many deeply religious Jewish people will not say God's name. The Tetragrammaton yud heh vav I, I do. Uh, there is no Torah law that says I cannot say God's name. I'm not going to take his name in vain. I happen to pronounce it Yahweh. Uh, there are people, maybe yourself, you pronounce it Yahweh. Uh, there are other pronunciations as well. And there is no agreement among Christians as to how it's pronounced. There's always a fascinating discussions between Christians. Some say one way, some say another. <laughs> and, and more people come in and they say there's a third way of doing it. So I say Yahweh. But... In Jesus' day, they did not say it. And the rabbis, the Pharisees, they created a fence around Torah. So what I mean by that is this. The commandment says, do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. So the rabbis, who were part of the Pharisees, they said, hey, here's an idea. Let's not even say God's name. So we're going to create another law around the law in Torah in the written word because if we don't say his name, how can we break the law? I, and I think that's what's going on. I think that's what's going on with regards to these feasts. Now the Torah says for the first day of unleavened bread and the seventh day of unleavened bread that you can't work. Okay, I agree, because in all the verses with regards to the Sabbath, you're not supposed to work. So, there's a sense of agreement. Number two, that the Torah says that on the first day of unleavened bread and the seventh day of unleavened bread, not only you can't work, but you need to have to have a mikra hakodesh, and that's Hebrew for a holy convocation. In other words, a holy gathering. People are gathered together uh, on this day. However, on the first day of unleavened bread, especially, and the seventh day of unleavened bread, you can cook, you can make a fire. Now, in the Sabbath, on the Sabbath, no fire is allowed. Let me go to Exodus 35, verses 1, 2, and 3. Then Moses assembled all the congregation of the sons of Israel, and he said to them, These are the things that the Lord has commanded you to do. For six days work may be done, but on the seventh day you shall have a holy day, a Sabbath of complete rest to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. You shall not kindle a fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day. You shall not kindle a fire at all on the Sabbath day. So the feast 
are not Sabbaths according to God's word. And it's likely the Pharisees are treating it like a Sabbath because they say, if we treat the first day of unleavened bread and the seventh day of unleavened bread as a Sabbath, how can we profane the feast? So this is perhaps what's going on. Now the Sadducees, they disagreed. They said, no, God's word says that it's the day after the Sabbath. So they would say that indeed the count should begin on Sunday. The Sadducees did not agree with the idea of the Pharisees making up these additional laws. They wanted to actually take a look at what the Torah says exactly without adding to God's word. So the Sadducees did not treat the feast as Sabbaths. But in Jesus' day, the Pharisees, <laughs> their way won out. Now this is what's fascinating. Now in Jesus' day, the Pharisees' way and practices won out because they were very, very popular with the people and the Sadducees were not. But if it's 30 AD, the first day of unleavened bread would be a Friday. There'd be a double Sabbath according to the Pharisees because you'd have a Sabbath, first day of unleavened bread would be Friday according to the Pharisees, not according to the Torah. The Torah does not say the first day of unleavened bread is a Sabbath. The Pharisees did. And they treated it that way. So from the Pharisees' point of view, they say that is a Sabbath. But then the next day is a Sabbath. There's a double Sabbath because then you have Saturday. You have the weekly Sabbath. Now, the weekly Sabbath is considered the greatest of all of the appointed times of God. Remember, uh, the Bible does not say that they're feasts. It says that they're appointed times. And the Sabbath was a greater than all of the others. So, in 30 AD, the count probably started on Sunday, on the Feast of Bikurim, on the Resurrection Day, counting seven weeks or seven Sabbaths, that the 50th day would be on a Sunday. So, if it starts on a Sunday, and you're counting seven weeks, not seven Sabbaths, no matter what you do, your count ends on a Saturday and the 50th day is going to be a Sunday. For the Sadducees, the same thing would happen. They would count seven Sabbath weeks and they would end at the same time. 30 AD forces the feast of bickering to adhere to God's word, not to the Pharisees' interpretation. So again, it seems as if God picked the one year, 30 AD, the only time where all things work together. In 30 AD, Jesus rides into Jerusalem. And if it's the first Palm Sunday, it's Lamb Selection Day. It'll be the 10th of Nisan. 30 AD means he would be buried on a Thursday. Buried on a Thursday. And in 30 AD, his very words where he said, that the Son of Man will be in the ground for three days and three nights means that he would rise on a Sunday if he's buried on a Thursday. It fits. 30 AD, the resurrection would be on the Feast of Bikarim. 30 AD, the Omer count would more than likely count, uh, start. And the reason why it would start on a Sunday, if God said that the count or the Feast of Bikarim would happen the day after the Sabbath, the Pharisees would say, okay, if Friday is a Sabbath and Saturday is a Sabbath, we got two Sabbaths in a row, it's likely that they would say, okay, we have to start it on a Sunday. So in 30 AD, the Pharisees' view is forced into the very words of God. In 30 AD, we find that the words of God stand and they cannot be debated. So now we come to the main focus of of lesson four and that's the last meal of jesus it's the night before he's crucified and we're going to take a look at that very carefully but is it the night before the passover lambs are slain we'll take a look at that the church calls it the last supper and i think it's more than a last meal it's more than a last supper 
I, I like to call it the Passover meal of the Messiah. The Passover meal of Yeshua. The Passover meal of the Lamb of God. By the way, one thing I want to do is, in the rest of this session, the Last Supper, I will call the Last Supper the Passover meal of Messiah. And this will be, to differentiate Jewish Seder, the Passover meal that would happen after the Passover lambs are slain on Nisan 14. I'm going to call that the Passover meal of Israel. So the Last Supper is the Passover meal of Messiah and the normal meal of the Jewish people that some people call the Jewish Seder. Today, I'm going to call the Passover meal of Israel to distinguish both of those. So what is it about this event that's so awesome? What can't we see? What don't we hear or understand? Well, let's go again back to walk those ancient paths and the ways like the ancients did. Let's go back to hear what they heard, to see what they saw. And in this way, let's try to grasp what they may have understood. Then perhaps we'll be able to add to our understanding of the Last Supper of Messiah. Let's again put this event in its historical context. Now, one thing I want to do with regards to the Passover meal of Messiah, the Last Supper, there's always a question, where did it happen? Where was the location? Now, those of you that have ever gone to Jerusalem, if you've ever gone to the Greek Quarter, there is a place, a two-story building, that you can actually visit. And supposedly, that is the place of the Last Supper. There is a term uh, that is used to refer to that building. It's called a cenacle, actually the second story room, the cenacle. And cenacle is just it just means upper room. In that two-story building, the second floor supposedly is where the Last Supper occurred, and on the main floor is supposedly where David, King David, was buried. And it just so happens that uh, we're both wrong. The Jewish people who think that King David was buried uh, and that's the location there uh, on the main floor, that's wrong. And the fact uh, that uh, many Christians would say, no, the upper room uh, is that second floor. Uh, sorry, it can't. I want you to check out the article on the website, www.lightamenorah.org from Biblical Archaeology Review. And it talks about real archaeology of the building. The reality of the, <laughs> is that this building was built by the Crusaders. It didn't exist before the Crusaders. Oh, there were buildings that were there. But the building that you see was built by the Crusaders. That building didn't even exist in Jesus' day. So the actual location hasn't been found. Perhaps, due to tradition, the current site could be actually built on the building where Jesus actually had his Last Supper, perhaps. But one thing's for sure, it happened somewhere. But archaeology, real scholarship, has not found it yet. Now, one thing that is clear so far is the Lord is connecting Jesus' death to Passover. There's no doubt about it. But the Lord seems to be making a distinction between the events in Jesus' life and the events in the Jewish people's lives. On the first day of unleavened bread, there is the Passover meal of Israel. It's a remembering what God did. He redeemed Israel out of the bondage of slavery. In Exodus 12, 14, it talks about the fact that it's a memorial day to remember the great deliverance. In Exodus 12 and 26 through 27, it talks about the fact when your children ask you about what's this all about, you are, tell, you are to tell them about what God did. We're supposed to remind them. So this is a remembrance. But in the previous session, we shared unequivocally. We demonstrated it without a doubt for instance, that Jesus is not 
the Passover lamb. The New Testament writers said Jesus is like the Passover lamb, but they never said he is the Passover lamb. It was a mistranslation of the Greek in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. I find many in the church, either Sunday believers or Saturday believers, Messianic Christians, they simply can't let go of their understanding that Jesus is the Passover lamb. It, it was for me. But it was until I put the Bible in context, until I decided to find out what his word actually said and not what men said or men's opinions were. I wanted to see what the events were, especially when we put the Bible in its context. Now, the actual Greek in 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says Jesus is the Passover and not the Passover lamb. And we remember in session 3, in the Old Testament, Passover is a day. This is exactly the words of God. But the New Testament, the Passover is a person. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Jesus is the Passover. It's now become Jesus. So God's word seems to be making a clear distinction. He seems to be separating the two events. You've got the death of the Passover lamb and the death of the, and the, death of the lamb of God. The Passover lamb is a time to remember of those events connected to Moses, who was called the first redeemer. And who was the one used by God to deliver the Israelites out of the bondage of slavery? But then we talk about the Lamb of God, and this is connected to the Messiah. For us, Messiah Jesus, a distinction, a clear distinction between Moses and Messiah. Now, archaeology, the archaeology in ancient Egypt, seems to enhance our understanding of the first redemption in Egypt and the ultimate redemption through Jesus in Jerusalem. Now, let's go back. First, the fathers in Egypt in 1446 BC were to pick a specific type of lamb. Let me go to Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month they are each one to take a lamb for themselves according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. Now if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in them, according to what each man should eat. You are to divide the lamb. Your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats." So, a lamb is picked, one year old, unblemished. When you study lambs, sheep, you find out that a male lamb matures roughly at six months. And we're dealing with a one year old male lamb. So, therefore, a one year old male lamb is considered an adult. When you talk about an adult male lamb, you're talking about a ram. So the Passover lamb might be called the Passover ram. Now, with regards to the archaeology of Egypt, the archaeologists found something really quite amazing. The main god of Egypt in the 18th dynasty, and the 18th dynasty would be that time period when the Exodus actually happened. It's the time of the Exodus. The main god of Egypt was Amun-Ra, the invisible one, the hidden one, the God mysterious in form. And he was Lord of all, Lord of all creation. Again, you can take a look at the link at the website, lightofmenorah.org, and I've given you a link to a full article that you can read about Amun, the supreme God of Egypt, at the time of the Exodus. Now, for the Hebrews, one of the things that is clear from the Bible point of view is it is very likely the Hebrews integrated into the Egyptian culture. And this began 
with with Joseph. I mean, once they went to bury Jacob, ancient city of Hebron, in the cave of Machpelah, Joseph returned with all the Hebrews that went down for the burial and the Egyptians, and they stayed. Why leave? And the Bible seems to indicate that indeed they assimilated into the culture. And so therefore, it could be that for many, if not most of the Hebrews, Amun-Ra became one of their chief gods. But then, if under slavery they decided that indeed they're going to follow Moses, and once they agreed to turn away from Egypt, they would begin sacrificing to the God of Moses, the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. And this is going to pose a problem for those Israelites who chose to follow Moses and so chose to follow the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Here's the problem. I'm going to go to Exodus 8, verses 25 and 26. Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Go sacrifice to your God within the land. But Moses said, It is not right to do so, for we will sacrifice to the Lord our God what is an abomination to the Egyptians. If we sacrifice what's an abomination to the Egyptians before their eyes, will they not stone us? The Hebrews are going to be sacrificing lambs and goats. Sacrificing a one-year-old male lamb, call it a ram, it would result in capital punishment. They would be stoned to death. Why? Why would they be killed? Why would they be executed for sacrificing a one-year-old male lamb? And like I said, that one-year-old male lamb is an adult. So the question is why? Why would they be executed for sacrificing a one-year-old male lamb, which is also considered a ram? And the reason being is, Amun-Ra, his sacred animal, was a ram. Amun-Ra is often pictured as a ram. Matter of fact, if you visit the Karnak Temple, the remains of the Karnak Temple in uh, the city of Luxor, Egypt, there is an entire street where there are rams on either side of the walkway. You're walking in between them. And this is the depiction of Amun-Ra. And under the chin of the ram is the Pharaoh, because Pharaoh was called the son of God. So God is commanding the Hebrews on the first pa Passover. He's commanding them to say, choose me or Amun-Ra. If you choose me, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob says, then slaughter Amun-Ra. Put the blood of that false god on the doorpost of your house, then the Lord says, when I see your commitment and your choice of me, then I will protect you from my wrath. The first Passover, dads chose the lamb, a ram. They knew it was a symbol of Amun-Ra. They knew it was a symbol of the supreme god of Egypt. Are they committed? Can they make that leap of faith to trust in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Are they serious? If they slaughter that lamb, they could be executed. Every Egyptian would see it. But God's promise is that he will pass over their house and save them from his wrath and they would be spared. Then we come to 30 AD. Jesus is chosen by his father on the first Palm Sunday. It's Lamb Selection Day. If you recall, the people wanted a king. The people wanted a victorious king to kick out the Romans. So who chose the lamb that day? God our Father. It's quite clear in Luke 9, 5. Luke chapter 9, verse 5. The Father says, this is my chosen one, my only begotten son, my firstborn. Jesus is the Father's Lamb. Jesus is the Lamb of God. But wait a minute. <laughs> Jesus is a male. He's unblemished. He has no sin. He's mature. Lamb of God? He is the Ram of God. And the Ram of God will be slaughtered. 
his blood will be put on the wood on the cross and now we are to be redeemed redeemed from the bondage of sin and we see this during the last supper we see this during the passover meal of the messiah jesus takes the cup and he said this is a cup of new covenant in my blood the wine represents his blood the blood that will flow from the lamb of god on the cross on the wood and now begins a new covenant jerusalem and the passover meal of the messiah becomes even bigger than we imagined it's like a mirror the passover lamb reflects the lamb of god the doorposts reflect the cross the lamb a false god reflects jesus the lamb the true god there is the redemption from slavery and the redemption from sin a mirror passover becomes a mirror again at the website i'll give you a link to a video that will be found on the facebook page for light of menorah so it's www.facebook.com backslash light of menorah backslash but it was several days ago that i did a zoom meeting and a zoom lesson and it was called the mirror of passover and we'll go into a deeper aspect in that video of how there's a mirror between the events of the exodus and the deliverance of the people from the bondage of slavery as a reflection is of, of a mirror of the great deliverance for jew and gentile that came through jesus and his sacrifice on the cross so we have two lambs or two rams the dads at the head of the household chose the lamb in egypt and god the father chose the lamb on palm sunday this ends part one of session four there is just so much to cover i decided to break it up into two sessions in part two we're going to be dealing with more archaeology from ancient egypt the archaeology that's going to take already what we know of the importance of the last supper of jesus that i call the passover meal of messiah and it's going to enhance our understanding just as our understanding was enhanced with the idea of a one-year-old male lamb unblemished can also be called a ram we saw that jesus is the lamb of god and the ram of god we're also going to consider the question did jesus do a seder he didn't he couldn't have matter of fact the jewish people in jesus's day didn't do a seder they did a passover meal i call it the passover meal of israel we'll take a look at that as well so i want you to stay with me stay with me in part two of session four and you're going to see that the Passover meal of the Messiah is very much like a Passover Seder. Very much like the Passover meal of Israel, but it's more. So much more than we ever thought. Shalom. See you in part two.